Our guest, Professor Yonatan Adler, is an associate professor at the Department of the Land of Israel Studies and Archaeology at Ariel University, where he also heads the Institute of Archaeology. Adler was appointed in 2018 by the Minister of Culture to serve as a member of the Israel Council for Archaeology. He has written extensively on the subject of archaeological evidence relating to the observance of Torah law covering topics such as ancient ritual immersion pools, mikvaot, dietary laws, ancient tefillin found in the Judean desert, and chalk vessels used by Jews who observed the purity laws. Adler has directed excavations at several sites throughout Israel, most recently at Einot Amitai and at Reina, two sites in the Galilee where Roman-era chalk vessels, chalk vessel workshops, have been unearthed. It's my honor right now to introduce to us for a wonderful dialogue today. Professor Yonatan Adler, please join me in welcoming him. Okay. Let's set this up. Talk this morning will be about uh, my book, which uh, was just published this past Tuesday. Uh, afterwards, you can come uh, and, and purchase the copies uh, if you'd like. Um, and it'll be a synopsis of the book. Of course, it's hard to get into great detail, uh, but I will try to give a, a, a broad overview of what I do uh, in this book. So the Jewish way of life has been characterized for centuries by observance of Torah law. And what I mean by that is the myriad laws that we know of, uh, which characterize uh, the way a Jew behaves from the time that they wake up in the morning until they go to sleep at night, from cradle to grave, all spheres of life are covered by this Jewish law, by, by Torah law. Um, things like uh, the various holidays, uh, Shabbat, what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do on Shabbat. Dietary laws, what you're allowed to eat, what you're not allowed to eat. Um, with whom a person can uh, marry and have sexual intercourse with. Um, rituals like tefillin and mezuzah. Um, I mentioned uh, the, the festivals, so things like taking the four species on Sukkot, building booths on Sukkot, uh, eating matzah on Pesach, refraining from eating leavened, from eating chametz on Pesach, or even owning chametz on Pesach. Uh, there's laws that relate to civil law and criminal law. Like I said, almost every sphere of life is covered by Torah law. And the question that I ask in this book is, when did this all begin? When did Jews begin to keep the Torah? Now, to be clear, I'm not asking when the Torah was written down, when the Torah was put together. That's a separate question. That's a question which I would call uh, intellectual history or the history of ideas. Because I could imagine that the Torah was written down but was sitting on a shelf somewhere, gathering dust perhaps, or perhaps very few people knew about it, for centuries. The question that interests me is not the Torah per se, but the people, the masses, the regular everyday people. When did they come to know about the Torah? And when did they come to begin to put the Torah into practice in their daily lives? That's the question that I'm asking in this book. Um, and I'll explain the, the method that I use to, uh, to, um, to try to answer that question. Um, other books have been written, I'm not going to get into detail of the history of scholarship, um, but other books have been written on the question of uh, the early Judaism and uh, Judaism's beginnings. A book recently published by Daniel Boyarin uh, makes the argument that Judaism is actually a modern notion. Um, but what he means by that is if we think of Judaism as a religion like Islam and Christianity and Hinduism and Buddhism, then Judaism is a modern is a modern notion because religion as something separate from day, from actual life 
is actually a modern notion, right? In, in antiquity and actually throughout most of history, uh, Judaism was never something separate from regular life, right? What I just described, Torah observance, covering everything, all aspects of life, that's not something separate from, uh, f f from life. It it's part and parcel of it. So again, what interests me is the question of, uh, of, of Torah observance in, in daily life. Biblical scholars, um, already from the 19th century, have noticed something very interesting about uh, the Bible. When the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, okay, for the, the Tanakh, Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim, um, the, the, the figures that we find, that we meet when we're reading the Hebrew Bible, don't seem to be practicing Judaism, right? Think about figures like King David, King Solomon, all the kings of Israel and Judah, the various prophets and so on, we never find them keeping Shabbat. We never find them putting on tefillin. We hear about King David building a palace, but we don't hear about him putting mezuzot on the doors. Um, we, we find biblical figures that are holding a spear and a sword, but never a lulav. We hear about the shofar being blown, but always in preparation for war, never on Rosh Hashanah. We never hear of anybody fasting on Yom Kippur. Scholars have noticed this for a long time. Uh, and their conclusion was, it seems, that the Torah was not known, was not being observed in the early periods, in the periods that are described in the biblical stories. So in the first temple period, the understanding of biblical scholars was that there was no Judaism. Instead, there was ancient Israel. There was, of course, uh, cultic practices. People brought sacrifices. There was a temple or several temples to the Jewish God. But that does not imply knowledge of the Torah or observance of the Torah. It was only after the exile, the exile to Babylonia in 586 BCE, that something called Judaism uh, emerged, that, that the Torah came, became known and, and began to be observed. And so there was this watershed of the exile. Pre-exile, we have ancient Israel. Post-exile, we have Judaism. This was the notion that, uh, that um, began with a German Protestant scholar by the name of De, uh, De Wette in the early 19th century. And this notion continued throughout the 19th century um, among several uh, biblical scholars. The most famous was uh, Julius Wellhausen at the end of the 19th century. And this idea continues until today. Basically, the idea is based on a story that we find uh, in the biblical books of Ezra and Nehemiah, which tell of a figure named Ezra who came from Babylonia and brought the Torah with him. He, uh, he came to Jerusalem. He stood on a platform in the, in the center of Jeru Jerusalem, and he read the Torah before all the people. And the people, for the first time, hear the Torah being read, and he discovers uh, that you're supposed to build Sukkot. You're supposed to build booths on, on the holiday of Sukkot. And so they go, the people go out. They, they had never heard of this before. They go out, they collect wood, and they build a Sukkot for the first time uh, uh, in centuries. That, that, that's the story that's told. Wellhausen says, well, if that's what it says in the, this biblical story, that must have been what happened, and Ju Judaism must have started from then. The problem is we don't do history that way. We don't simply read a story and say, oh, it sounds right. It must have happened. That's not, that's not how history is done. To do history, we need to look for evidence. And that's the approach that I take in the book. Um, I'll explain the method that I use. It's actually quite a simple method. I take a period in time when we know that there was Judaism. We know that the Jewish people were aware of the Torah, regarded it as authoritative, and were putting it into practice. As I'll, I will show uh, during this lecture, the first century of the Common Era 
is precisely such a time. The first century of the Common Era, so this is the time when the first century, of course, begins with, what's the first event in the first century? Jesus is born, and then he's crucified. That's We start the Common Era from the birth of, of Jesus. So Jesus is born, he's crucified. The temple is destroyed. The second temple is destroyed in the year 70. This century is a century where within which we have a tremendous amount of textual evidence and archaeological evidence, as we'll see, uh, which indicate that there was Judaism, that, that Jews knew of the Torah, regarded it as authoritative, and were practicing it. Then what I do is I go backwards in time from then, from the first century. I go to the first century before the Common Era, to the second century before the Common Era, to the third century before the Common Era, to the fourth century before the Common Era, backwards in time, continuing to look for evidence that Jews were practicing the Torah. And what I'm looking for is where the trail of evidence ends. Where the trail of evidence ends means that I no longer have, going backwards in time, I no longer have evidence that Jews were keeping the Torah. Now, when I reach that point, what have I discovered? I've discovered that there's no more evidence that Jews are keeping the Torah. That doesn't necessarily imply that Judaism begins precisely then. In archaeology, we have a technical term. It's called a terminus antiquem. It's a technical term in Latin, which means a period from then and before. Okay, So from where the trail of evidence ends, that's our terminus antiquem, when Judaism must have begun then or earlier. It's possible that we simply don't have evidence because evidence hasn't survived. It's possible that people were keeping the laws of the Torah. We simply don't have evidence for it. But it's extremely important that we are able to put on the table what we know, what evidence we actually have, and what we, evidence we don't have. So the idea is to, 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 to determine a terminus antiquem. And then the next step is, OK, so the period when we don't have evidence, what do we do then? What do we know about that period? And what, what, how can we speculate about how Judaism might have, when and how Judaism might have uh, first emerged during that period of time when we don't have evidence? When I speak of evidence, I'm using that term uh, quite often here, I mean two things. Textual evidence, so written sources that we have from, from antiquity, and archaeological evidence. Now, Textual evidence is great. Um, the thing is, with textual evidence, we have to remember that what our, our interest in here is the masses, what the masses, the regular, ordinary people are doing. Texts, by definition, are written by literate people who not only know how to read and write, but they know how to write highly uh, sophisticated texts. These are the texts that have come down to us. Um, and by definition, these are not of the masses. These are intellectuals that are, that are writing these, these written sources, sources like uh, the historian, the ancient historian Josephus Flavius, uh, Philo of Alexandria, the writers of the Apocrypha and uh, various Jewish texts that we have from ancient times, the Dead Sea Scrolls. These were all written by highly literate people who, by definition, are not of the masses. So th there's a slight problem that we have when we're looking at texts in that they're not necessarily representative of the ordinary people. We have to read between the lines and not necessarily accept everything that our ancient authors uh, have to tell us. Archaeology provides a different kind of window on the ancient past and a window which is particularly um, powerful for um, for, for, for providing information about the masses, right? If I, if I excavate sites throughout a country and I find a certain phenomenon that we find in site after site after site, the evidence that that provides is on what the masses are doing, what the ordinary everyday people are doing, as opposed to, again, the texts which are penned by intellectuals. So archaeology is really a wonderful... Uh, tool 
if our interest is in what the masses are actually doing. Archaeology is a really wonderful tool for uh, discerning human behaviors in the past. And that's, that's exactly what we're, what we're interested in. Um, so just a brief overview of how the book is arranged. Uh, e each chapter of the first six chapters looks at a different set of practices, uh, prohibitions or positive practices, which uh, characterize Torah law. So the first chapter looks at dietary laws. I'll, I'll get into each of these uh, one by one. That'll, that'll be the bulk of our lecture here. The dietary laws, what, uh, what, what you're allowed to eat, what you're not allowed to eat. Ritual purity. Figural art. I'll explain each of these uh, shortly. Tefillin and mezuzot. Miscellaneous practices, things like circumcision, Shabbat, um, uh, various holidays, Passover, Yom Kippur, Sukkot. The synagogue. When does the synagogue first emerge? And then in the final chapter, I look at the question of, okay, what can we say about when Judaism first emerged on the basis of the terminus antiquem that we've, that we've uh, um, settled upon? To cut to the chase, what we will see as we go through the evidence, in chapter after chapter, there is no evidence for the observance of Torah law prior to the middle of the second century before the Common Era. I'll say that again. There's no evidence for the observance of Torah law amongst the masses any time prior to the middle of the second century before the Common Era. So to get a, a sense of when that is, this is the period of the Hasmoneans. So the story of Hanukkah, when the, uh, with the Maccabean Revolt, it takes place around 167 to 164 BCE. Sometime after that, we begin to see evidence for Torah observance. Nothing before that. Now, this is quite a bit later than the standard notion that Judaism begins, the standard among scholars, that Judaism begins quite soon after the, uh, the exile to Babylonia. Um, and so that's, that, that's what's new about uh, the results of, of, of my book. All right, let's get into it. So the dietary laws. Of course, the dietary laws, um, the most famous of the dietary laws are the species of animals that, uh, that the Torah forbids. Uh, the most famous is, of course, pork. Um, and we have, from the first century of the Common Era, a large amount of evidence that Jews were abstaining from pork. We have texts which describe uh, Jews as not eating pork, particularly the Romans, who ate a lot of pork, uh, saw this as very strange. The Jews stood out as this group that, that doesn't eat pig. Um, we even have jokes that the Romans would tell about the Jews uh, that they didn't eat uh, pork. Would you like to hear a joke? So there's a story that uh, Augustus, the Emperor Augustus, uh, would joke about his uh, client king, Herod, the Jewish king Herod. Uh, Herod, of course, was known as being a nasty fellow. He killed his, his wife and he killed his sons and he, he wasn't a very nice person, very murderous. And the, the joke that Augustus told was that he would prefer, if he had a choice, he would prefer to be Herod's pig rather than his son. So the idea, of course, that he wouldn't slaughter his pig, but his son he would have no problem slaughtering. Now, if it wasn't the case that Jews were refraining from eating pig, the joke would have fallen flat on its face. Right? So, so when J Romans are telling jokes about Jews not eating pig, we can, we can understand the, impl the implication is that Jews actually weren't eating pig because otherwise it, the, these jokes wouldn't be funny. Um, we have archaeological evidence that non-Jews were eating pig in large numbers in the land of Israel. There, so the land of Israel, it was not only Jews that were living. There were Greek cities. There were uh, other groups that were, were living in the land of Israel. The non-Jews ate lots of pigs. The Jews didn't. Um, and when we go backwards in time 
the, the, the textual evidence which suggests that Jews were refraining from eating pigs ends at the Hasmonean period. That we have no texts which describe uh, Jews refraining from eating pig or any, any kind of species of animal uh, prior to the Hasmonean period. An interesting uh, species which, which we can study uh, or, or a set of uh, animal bones that we can study is fish bones, fish remains. Um, the Torah forbids eating fish that lack fins and scales. So fish like shark, which don't have scales, rays, and catfish, which don't have scales, are forbidden according to the Torah. We can study when were Jews eating or not eating fish like this. And what we find is that all throughout the first temple period, all throughout the Iron Age, into the Persian period, Jews are eating catfish. We, found, we find their bones throughout Judea and Jerusalem, catfish bones. So this is an, a clear indication that Jews are eating food that is forbidden in the Torah for centuries through the Persian period. It's only in the later periods, once we reach the Hellenistic period, the Roman period, that we no longer find uh, such evidence. Purity is another uh, category of laws, uh, which in the first century of the Common Era, we have a tremendous amount of evidence that Jews are keeping the purity laws. So when I say the purity laws, I'm referring to things like uh, the, the various kinds of impurity, such as menstrual impurity and semen impurity, uh, corpse impurity, impurity of uh, certain kinds of species of animals uh, that, that die. Um, all of these are considered uh, sources of impurity. And the way that one removes the impurity, the, one that, the way that one purifies a person or an object, is through ritual immersion in a ritual immersion pool, in a mikveh. Um, so we have a tremendous amount of evidence for this in the first century of the Common Era archaeological evidence. We have textual evidence indicating that Jews were keeping these rules on a day-to-day -day basis. Step pools we find all throughout the country, these, these ritual immersion pools. We find them at Jewish sites and only at Jewish sites. And as I say, they're found throughout the country in the hundreds. Basically, any site that you excavate that was settled by Jews, you're going to find usually several of these pools. Um, when did the, this, this kind of archaeological uh, remains, this kind of artifact, first appear on the archaeological record? I'll let you guess. In the middle of the second century BCE, the, during the Hasmonean period. Okay, there are no, actually, the, the, probably the end of the second century BCE, around the year 100, um, there are no ritual pools prior to the Hasmonean period. They, they, they simply do not exist. Um, and once they do exist, we find them everywhere. So, so archaeologists are really good at dating things. That's, that's what we do. Um, and we, we are able to date things on the basis of uh, artifacts that we find together with an installation like a, a, a step pool, um, pottery, and coins, usually. Another phenomenon which is related to the uh, ritual purity laws is chalk vessels. Um, the cantor had mentioned uh, that I uh, am excavating at two sites where these chalk vessels uh, were, were actually being produced. So what's the issue with chalk vessels? Uh, according to Leviticus 11, uh, if you have uh, pottery, which is what people had, you know, that was the standard uh, vessels, tableware and storage vessels. They were made of pottery. If pottery becomes impure, according to Leviticus, you have to break the pottery. Stone isn't mentioned in the list of materials that, uh, that can become impure. So once we reached uh, the first century of the Common Era, it was understood that stone doesn't become impure. So Jews were making vessels out of stone, particularly this uh, chalk. It's a kind of limestone. Um, they made both uh, tableware and storage, very large storage vessels, um, in order to prevent the spread of, of ritual impurity. It's only Jews that are making vessels out of this material, 
and they're making it specifically because stone was considered impervious to ritual impurity. Okay, great. We can study the question of when Jews were keeping these purity laws by looking for when the stone vessels first appear and when they disappear. Eventually they disappeared. Guess when the stone vessels first appear? Second century, the Hasmonean period. Right? We don't have any stone vessels before that. So again, another indication that that uh, the, the, the earliest evidence we have for this set of, of, of rules, the, the ritual purity rules, is the Hasmonean period. Once they appear, they appear everywhere. So this is something which was widely, widely uh, practiced. Prior to the Hasmonean period, we have no evidence that this was being practiced. Figural art. So uh, the Ten Commandments, everyone knows. It's not that many commandments, so it's easy enough to remember. What was the second commandment? No graven images, exactly. So this was understood when we get to the first century of the Common Era. This was understood to mean you cannot have any images of humans or animals in artwork. No humans or animals. And indeed, um, we have texts which describe this, and we also have archaeological evidence of Jewish art again, throughout the country, which never or almost never has depictions of humans or animals. We always have um, either geometric designs or floral designs, never, almost never, uh, humans or animals. This is particularly uh, evident on the coins, uh, because coins always include a face, Whose face do we put on the coin? The, in, the, in the case of the Roman Empire, the emperor. In the case of uh, monarchy, you, you put the king on. Uh, in the United States, we don't have a monarchy. We have presidents, so we have former presidents. We don't put on the current president. We have former presidents. Um, but in monarchies, in Britain, in Scandinavian countries, uh, Belgium, Holland, wherever you have a king or a queen, you put the king or the queen on the coin, and then you switch the, 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 the face when the, there's a new monarch. This was the case in antiquity as well. It was throughout the, the medieval period. This is what you do. You put the leader on the coins. This was a way of also, this was propaganda for the leader to show I'm, I'm the leader. The Hasmoneans and all Jewish rulers after them didn't put their face on their coins. Instead, they did something else. They put on what I would call a textural portrait. So we have here the first coins minted by the Hasmoneans, John Hyrcanus the first. Uh, the earliest of his coins can be very well dated to around 132 BCE. What does he have on his coins? His name and his title. Yochanan HaKohen HaGadol VeChever HaYehudim. Right? John, the high priest, and the assembly of the Judeans. This is this instead of this, instead of a face, it's a description of him. It's as if we have his face, but instead of a a, a picture, we have words, right, which replace the picture. So, to my mind, it's extremely clear what's going on here. The ruler is very consciously refraining from putting his face on the coin, and this is the case with all Jewish coins from the times of the Hasmoneans and onwards in, throughout the first century of the Common Era. Not only the Jews didn't put um, uh, uh, pictures of, of humans or animals on their coins, when the Romans came and the Romans minted coins, the Roman procurators and governors were minting coins for the Jews, they too refrained from putting the emperor on the coin because they were afraid of riots. They knew that if they were to put uh, the emperor on the, the Jewish coins, they would have riots on their hands. The Jews wouldn't use the, the, the money. Um, and so, so it's extremely clear the Jews were keeping these rules. The question is when. So when we go to an earlier period of time, the third century before the Common Era, we have figural art on every single coin that Jews minted. We know that Jews were minting them because they have uh, Jewish names on them. They have Hebrew on them. This coin says Yehudah, the Judea, the name of the province in Hebrew. 
in the fourth century before the common era, so during the Persian period, we have names of Jewish governors, Chizkiah um, Pecha, that are clearly minted by Jews, Jewish leaders, uh, with not only do we have figural art here, does anyone recognize on the right side what that is? An owl. It's the attribute of the goddess Athena, the Greek goddess Athena. Um, so not only do we have graven images, we actually have pagan images. Um, it's a copy of a coin that was minted in Athens. Uh, and here we have a coin of the Jewish high priest, Yohanan HaKohen, it says in Hebrew. Again, with the owl of Athena uh, on one side and a face on the other side. Clearly, there's no uh, qualms that these people have about uh, minting graven images on the coins. Again, this is periods right before the, the Hasmonean period. Tefillin and Mezuzot, um, we all know what, what Tefillin and Mezuzot are. We have evidence, uh, archaeological evidence, for uh, Tefillin and probably Mezuzot as well from the first century of the Common Era. The, these were uh, found in the Judean desert at Qumran and elsewhere. This is a Tefillin case. Inside of these cases were uh, slips with scriptural passages written on them from the books of Exodus and Deuteronomy. People were, if people were keeping this ritual uh, practice in the first century of the Common Era. Uh, the earliest tefillin that have been discovered date to the Hasmonean period, nothing before that. Uh, mezuzah, probably we have some mezuzot from the Judean desert as well. Also, they do not date to any time prior to the Hasmonean period. Miscellaneous practices. Circumcision. Um, we don't have archaeological evidence precisely for uh, circumcision, uh, but we do have textual evidence. And although it does seem that Jews, ancient uh, Israelites, were practicing circumcision, there were other peoples that were practicing circumcision as well. And what interests me is the question, when was circumcision regarded not only as some kind of cultural practice, when was it considered a law? When was it considered something that you do because the Torah says that you have to. And that we have evidence for from the Hasmonean period and onward. We don't have any evidence uh, for that before this. Sabbath, also uh, a practice which we don't precisely have archaeological evidence for. We have some texts, ancient texts, which were discovered, which mention uh, Shabbat. We don't have any evidence that anyone was keeping any kind of prohibitions on Shabbat prior to the Hasmonean period. I'll go one step further. We don't have any evidence that Jews, or anyone else for that matter, were observing a seven-day week. That, it's, it's a little hard to, 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 to wrap our minds around the idea of living life without a seven-day week. But we have to remember, keeping time um, is always associated with some kind of natural phenomenon. So the, the day is 24 hours. Why? because it takes 24 hours for the sun, for, for, the, uh, for the earth to spin around and for the sun to rise. And, and, and from, from sunrise to sunrise is 24 hours, right? It's a natural phenomenon. The year is 365 days and a quarter. Why? Because if you look outside, you see it gets cold and then it gets hot. It takes 365 days. Now we know that it's the earth going around the sun, but it takes six, 365 days for this natural phenomenon that we call the year. The month is around 30 days. Why? The moon. It takes th approximately 30 days for the moon to get big and then to get small again. The week is not connected to any natural phenomenon. Why seven days? Why not six days? Why not three days? Why any days? Why, why do we need a week at all? We have no evidence that anyone considered time to be divided according to seven days prior to the Hasmonean period, right? It's actually the Jews that began this notion of a seven-day week because it says so in the Torah and because it says that you have to count seven days and at the end of the seven days is, is Sabbath, where you rest. Essentially, the seven-day week is so that you can have Shabbat at the end of the week. Um, and again, we have no evidence. Think about the Bible, right? What, do we have any, any stories in the Bible about 
um, you know, something happening on a Tuesday? We don't. Oh, on a Wednesday? We don't. Think we have dates of the month. We have years. We never have days of the week. And it seems that prior to the Hasmonean period, uh, there, there was no seven-day week. Passover. Um, so we have no evidence that people were, keep, were refraining from eating leaven on, on Passover or, or eating unleavened bread on Passover, again, prior uh, to the Hasmonean period. There is a document which was found on, a, on an island in the Nile called Elephantine. We have uh, actually a large number of documents from a Jewish, uh, a Jewish garrison that was living on Elephantine in the Persian period, so the 5th century before the Common Era. And there's one famous uh, papyrus, which is called the Passover papyrus, so the Elephantine Passover letter. And this papyrus is written in Aramaic. It's actually very readable. And scholars have claimed that this papyrus is evidence that people are keeping the Passover, because the papyrus talks about uh, Passover, it talks about a holiday for seven days, <clears throat> when you are not allowed to eat uh, leavened, and you're, you should be eating unleavened bread, you shouldn't have leavened in the house, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so one would think that this is evidence that Jews were keeping the Torah's laws about Passover already in the fifth century of the Common Era. The problem with this evidence is that all of the parts of this letter that talk about Passover are in the reconstructed parts of the letter. Have a look. You notice that the whole lower right-hand portion of the letter is missing. So all the parts of this letter which talk about the Passover are in the reconstructed parts. When we take away the reconstruction, we no longer have the Elephantine Passover letter. We just have the Elephantine letter. Uh, there's, there's nothing in the actual uh, remains of this papyrus which say anything about Passover or leavened or unleavened or, or, or anything of the sort. Day of Atonement, the holiest day of the Jewish year. No evidence that people were observing any kind of Day of Atonement, fasting or anything prior to the Hasmonean period. Sukkot, we have lots of evidence from the first century, lots of evidence. We have some evidence from the first century that Jews uh, were keeping the, the Sukkot uh, rituals, the, the four species, the Lulav and Etrog, um, myrtle and wi willow. Um, we have coins, for example, from the Jewish revolt uh, from the year 6970 uh, of the Common Era, which depict the four species. We have some evidence from the first century of the before the Common Era, perhaps the second century before the Common Era, nothing before that. The same goes for uh, uh, the, the Sukkot themselves, the, the booths. Here's an interesting one. <clears throat> the menorah. So the menorah is a Jewish symbol, has been for quite some time. Uh, there, it's based on the idea that you have a, you're supposed to have a golden seven-branched candelabrum in the tabernacle. That's what uh, Exodus uh, commands, prescribes. And we have lots of evidence from the first century of the common era that there was such a candelabrum in the temple and that people knew about it, that regular everyday people knew about it because they depicted it in their art, they depicted it in their graffiti. Uh, we find it on, on a, uh, a series of coins. Um, Jews knew about this seven-branched menorah and they put it in their art, but never before the Hasmonean period. So we don't have any any graffiti, any, any artistic depictions at all of a seven-branched menorah prior to the Hasmonean period. Now, the synagogue is... Yeah. What do you mean by Hasmonean period? I'm sorry? What do you mean by Hasmonean period? Ha Hasmonean period, the, the Hasmonean, the Maccabees. Okay, so that's the, the, uh, the Maccabean revolt against the, the Greeks uh, from the story of Hanukkah. This family that revolted against uh, the Greek uh, domination around the middle of the second century before the common era, that was the Hesmonean family, the Maccabees. Okay. Um, okay, the synagogue is a bit different. The synagogue is not actually a practice or a prohibition, but the synagogue, when, so when we hear of the synagogue today, what do we think of? What's the first 
thing that we think of when we hear synagogue. Building, but what do you do in the building? Prayer, right? Prayer is what we think of. In ancient time, in, in, in the first century of the Common Era, the synagogue wasn't about prayer. The synagogue was what we're doing right here. It was an educational institution. It was a place where people would gather together once a week on Shabbat. Someone would take out a Torah, a Torah scroll, read the Torah, and educate the people about what was what was written in the Torah, about the laws that are written, the laws and the stories that are written in the Torah. What's the idea of a synagogue? Essentially, in antiquity, the vast majority of the people presumably didn't know how to read and write. They didn't know how to read. So even if they had a Torah scroll, which almost nobody had because it's expensive to have a Torah scroll. Nobody had a Torah scroll at home. So people didn't have a Torah scroll. And they, even if they had, they didn't know how to read it. But if you had one Torah scroll in your community and you had one fellow in your community who knew how to read it, you can gather all the people together and the person that had the Torah scroll and knew how to read it would read it in front of everyone, explain what's written in it, and then the people know what's written in that Torah. Now, the Torah is complicated. There's a, lot of, there's a lot in there. There's a lot of laws. The only way that people could know those laws and put them into practice is if they were educated in it. You needed to have something like the synagogue in order to spread knowledge of Torah and, 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 and observance of Torah. You could, essentially, you couldn't have Judaism without an institution like the synagogue. And, and as such, it's important to know when the synagogue first appears. So <clears throat> most of our evidence for the synagogue comes from the first century of the Common Era. Um, we have, for example, this uh, dedicatory inscription from Jerusalem, which speaks about exactly this, what the synagogue was for. It tells of a certain, just like today, I see that there's uh, dedicatory inscriptions here with names of donors uh, all over uh, Sinai Temple. Uh, this was done already in antiquity. So we have here a Theodotus, the son of Vetinos, who uh, built uh, the, the, the synagogue. Um, and, but what's great about this inscription is that it explains why the synagogue was built. He built the synagogue for the reading of the law and the teaching of the commandments. So the, the, that was the purpose of the synagogue, for the reading of the law and teaching of the commandments. We have evidence for this from the first century of the common era, as I said. Um, far less evidence from the first century before the common era. Probably our earliest synagogue building is from a site called Umelum Dan, which dates, dates to the Hasmonean period. Nothing before that. No evidence for the synagogue before the Hasmonean period. Was it just men that were... Good question. It's an, it's an interesting question that we can, uh, that we can look at from, uh, from a textual perspective. I don't want to get into that. It seems, just, just to answer very briefly, it seems that women were also attending synagogues. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's, that brings us to the end of our data-driven study. Okay, so looking for evidence, chapter after chapter, topic after topic, we find no evidence before the Hasmonean period, before the middle of the second century of the Common Era. Now, how do we reconstruct? So it, did Judaism first appear during the Hasmonean period? Possibly, but also we cannot discount the possibility that prior to our terminus antiquem of the middle of the second century before the Common Era, when the trail of evidence ends, Maybe we don't have evidence because it didn't survive. It, it's always a possibility. So in this final chapter, this the seventh, seventh chapter of the book, I try to do a historical reconstruction. What can we say about the period of time before we have evidence? And what I do is I look at, I begin by looking at the Persian period. That's the period in time when scholars tend to think that Judaism first, first emerged based on the story that I mentioned about Ezra. And the thing is, when we look at the evidence that we do have from the Persian period, what we find is a couple of things that I mentioned. I mentioned figural art on every single coin minted by Judeans uh, during this period of time. Every single coin has figural art. Some of it is foreign gods. I mentioned Elephantine, that island in the Nile, with a large amount of texts that have survived from this Judean garrison. 
Uh, the Judeans that were living there were naming their children after the Jewish God. They called him Yaho. Um, but they were also naming their children after other gods. They were taking oaths by the Jewish God, but they were also taking oaths by other gods. They were, there was a temple to the Jewish God, which is against Torah law. According to the Torah, you can't have a temple outside of Jerusalem. Um, they had a temple to the Jewish God. And they were donating money to the Jewish God, but also to other gods. Also in Babylonia, we have some archives of uh, remains from, of Jewish uh, settlement in Babylonia from the 5th century before the Common Era. And again, we find uh, Jews naming their children after the Jewish God, but also after uh, foreign gods, Jews taking oaths by foreign gods. This period of time does not seem to be the best period to be seeking the, the, the emergence of Judaism. The practices don't seem to be uh, in line with Torah law. Um, and as such, I think it's a much uh, more profitable period of time to be seeking the origins of Judaism is during the subsequent period, the Hellenistic period. In the book, I make two suggestions for how, and they're, they're, they're conjectural, admittedly, for how Judaism might have begun. One thing that I point out is that the Hellenistic period is the first time that Jews come under domination of Greek culture. So Greek culture is, um, is dominant in every, every place that Jews were living during this period. Greek culture was dominant. And the Greeks are the ones that brought us the notion of written law. So the idea that there's a law that's written down that we can point to and say this is the law is an idea that the Greeks uh, invented. Prior to this, we have... Uh, law collections in Mesopotamia, the Code of Hammurabi, for example, and, and others. Um, but scholars have long understood that these are not actually written law. These aren't the law. These are texts which write about law, um, something perhaps along the lines of a, a legal textbook today. Right? Nobody would take a legal textbook that they, that they, um, that they buy for, for their class uh, when they're going to law school and say, this is the law. This is a book about the law. It's a book that teaches about the law. It's not the law itself. The Babylonians didn't have law written down. It was the Greeks that invented this. And one suggestion that I make is perhaps once the Jews come under Greek domination, um, they adopt this notion of written law and they adopt the Torah as their own written law. Um, it's a possibility, and if that's the case, then perhaps uh, this happened, let's say, in the third century before the Common Era, a century before the Hasmoneans. There, are, we know of uh, certain uh, uh, legal reforms that were going on at this time uh, under the Ptolemaic dynasty. So that's the dynasty ruling out of Egypt. These are the kings that were ruling over the land of Israel, Judea, at the time. Um, perhaps there's there's some kind of connection there, um, but. Perhaps, and this is in line with the evidence, it was only in the Hasmonean period that Judaism actually first emerges. And the idea that I suggest in the book is that perhaps the Hasmoneans, who for the first time since the Iron Age uh, have an independent Judean polity, right? an, an independent Jewish state, um, they needed some kind of law that would unite the people. That would, that would unite not only the Jewish people, but all the peoples that the Hasmoneans had conquered. So we know that the Hasmoneans conquered surrounding, uh, surrounding peoples, the Idumeans in the south, the Eturians in the north, the Samaritans to the north of Judea. And we know that the Hasmoneans enforced Torah on these people. Today we would say they, they forcibly converted them to Judaism. We have texts which tell us that the Hasmoneans enforced the Torah on these peoples. I don't think it's too far a stretch to suggest that the Hasmoneans did this for the Jews themselves. They brought the Torah, they adopted the Torah as the law of the land for their newly independent state. Um, and again, I want to stress that doesn't mean that the Torah was first written down at the time of the Hasmoneans. The Torah 
seems to have been quite a bit older than this period of time. But that, again, doesn't necessarily imply that people knew about it or regarded it as authoritative. According to this suggestion, it was the Hasmoneans that decided we're going to take this ancient Torah, adopt it as our law, and enforce it on the people. So that's, uh, that's, that, that's the suggestion uh, that, that I make in terms of, in terms of when Judaism uh, likely emerged and how. Um, I'd like to end with a question that I've been asked um, by several friends and colleagues. What are the implications of this study? So, okay, this is a, a cold, uh, critical, historical, scientific approach to, 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 to the question of the beginnings of Judaism. But what does this mean for us? What does this mean for us as Jews? Um, I think it's important to stress that the Bible itself, the, the foundational text of Judaism, never makes the claim that Judaism is ancient, that the Judaism goes back to the time of Sinai. So we have a story in the Bible about how the Torah was given by God to Moses at Mount Sinai. But what's the first thing that happens when God gives the Torah to the Jewish people? What are the, what's the first thing that the Jewish people do? Right there at the foot of Mount Sinai. They reject it. They build a golden calf. That's the first thing that the Jews do. And it only goes downhill from there. Throughout the rest of the Bible, we find story after story about how the, the Israelites reject the Torah, reject the Word of God. They don't do what they're supposed to do. That's what the prophets are all railing against. This is the story of the Hebrew Bible. It's something which perhaps is, isn't stressed um, in Hebrew school, but if you read the Bible from the beginning to the end, that's the story. Every once in a while, there's a treasured leader uh, uh, that, um, that brings Torah observance to the, to the people, that, that gets the people to sacrifice the, the Passover sacrifice, or gets the people to, to build Sukkot. Um, but the, 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 the scarlet thread that goes throughout the, uh, throughout the biblical story is that the people are not keeping the Torah. Um, and there's, there's a, a very important lesson here, which the rabbis noted. The rabbis tell us in Tractate Shabbat of the Talmud, that when God gave the Torah to the Jewish people, he held the, mount, the mountain, Mount Sinai, over the heads of the people and threatened them that if you accept the Torah, all is good. If you don't, I'm going to bury you under the mountain. It's a famous, famous story the rabbis tell. And so guess what? The people accepted the Torah <laughs> because they were forced to. But then a thousand years later, with the story of Purim, God saves the people from, from, from Haman, and out of love, the people accept the Torah. The people, this time out of love. This is, this is what the rabbis tell us. I think that the, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is the story that, 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 we, that, 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 this is the Jewish story, right? That if the Torah is forced upon us, it doesn't stick, and it doesn't last. And for the first time, millennium of Jewish history, there was no, the, pe the people weren't keeping the Torah because it was forced. It's only once the people accepted the Torah out of love that we have essentially the, the emergence of Judaism and, and we've, we have had it ever since. Thank you very much. That's, that's, that's the story that the rabbis tell in, in the Talmud. So, that's not a historical uh, story. This, uh, my book is, 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 I'm not doing theology in the book. I explain that in the, in the preface. I'm doing a uh, scientific historical study. Questions? The time. Yeah, okay. The Maccabees are 
begin approximately 150 BCE. So BCE is before the Common Era, minus 150. So we're going back 2,150 years ago. That's not so old. Questions? Since I'm a Persian Jew, and I'm very proud of it, always I uh, consider myself part of the history. The way you're saying, during Babylon and after, a lot of things happened. Yeah. So after, after the Babylonian period is the Persian period. This is the period when there were uh, kings ruling out of Persia. Um, so when we speak of the Persian period, this is the period of time when Judea was being ruled by Persian kings. So this is the, the, the standard notion that Judaism begins during the Persian period. In the book, I'm arguing that that's an unlikely period of time to, to seek the, the emergence of Judaism. You have a Persian community that exists from the time of the exile. Yeah. So, and they end up being normative Jews. So how does this standard Judaism get out through the Mediterranean world? Oh. They're not under Maccabean political control. Yeah, so that's an excellent question. There, there were Jewish communities not only in Persia, in Babylonia, um, in Egypt, uh, in Syria, and elsewhere. And... Judaism must have started somewhere and spread from there. My suggestion, and again, this is somewhat conjectural, is that Judaism likely began in Judea and spread from there. And you're right, the Hasmoneans had no political control over Jewish communities outside of Judea. And yet, Judaism did spread. We, we know that Jews were, were, were keeping the Torah eventually, right? When we get to the first century of the Common Era, we have evidence that Jews in Rome and in, in, in uh, Greek-speaking areas uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, in, in, in Egypt, were keeping uh, the Torah. Clearly, Judaism spread from somewhere. I think it's most likely that it would have spread out from Judea, and if so, perhaps it was, it was under uh, Hasmonean sponsorship. How long did it take to spread? We don't know. We, we simply don't have evidence for that. Other questions? Yeah. The Hasp exactly, the Hasmonean period, the Maccabean period. A, a, a bit over 2,000 years ago. Other, yeah. beginning of your um, your statement, you had said something about um, the uh, Jewish people began to observe once they mm -hmm. right. So no, the the question was how if Judaism began under the Hasmonean dynasty, the Hasmoneans only controlled a very small area. They controlled the area of Judea. They had no political uh, power over Jewish communities elsewhere in Persia, in, in, in Babylonia, in Egypt, and so on. Um, so the question is, how did Judaism spread uh, throughout the ancient world? I don't know the answer to that, but it's, it, clearly it did, right? Because we know that eventually there were Jewish communities that, that were keeping the Torah. I think it's probably likely that what happened was Judaism began in Judea itself, in the heartland, and spread from there. Exactly what the mechanism would have been for the spread of Judaism, I can say, I think it would likely have been through the synagogue, right? If synagogues were being built elsewhere, Torah knowledge was spread through, through the synagogue. Why did people start building synagogues? I can't give an exact, this is conjectural, I can't give an exact mechanism for how this notion spread outside of Judea, but clearly it did. of Judaism, that most people say that in the land of Israel they are not so, so religious, but in the diaspora of Judaism, you really have to, you really have to. Uh, 
Okay, so, so, so first of all, I'm an archaeologist. I look at, at really old stuff. Um, but in the book, I do have, um, uh, I, I talk about, you know, the definition, what, what do I mean when I talk about Judaism? And I say that um, Judaism, if, according to my definition that I use for the book, is the, um, the Jewish way of life governed by Torah law. And however that's interpreted. So the fact, the fact that if, if a Jew sits on uh, the night of the, of the Seder and he eats matzah, he or she eats matzah and drinks four cups of wine and eats maror uh, and tells the story of the Exodus, they are practicing Judaism, right? Whether they are Orthodox or conservative or reform or reconstructionist or none of the above. I put in a picture of, uh, of David Ben-Gurion sitting at a Seder eating matzah. He's practicing, even though he considered himself irreligious, he is practicing Judaism. He, the only reason he's eating this cracker on the night of the 15th of Nisan is because it says so in the Torah, right? So this is Judaism, and this we have, we have, we have this today, and we've had it since the Hasmonean period, at least. What's up? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, first of all, I'm sorry and thank you very much. Um, hear your everything you, you said. It's really uh, inspiring and thanks a lot. Um, I don't know if you you dived into it, but I am. You know, I I in the last like few years, I'm really researching about Islam and like Islam connection to Judaism and how it connects and like the similarities and a theory that I heard. I don't know if you you heard it, but people starting to question, even if we look at, in the Quran, um, the word Palestine is not mentioned in the Quran, and the word, even in the word Jerusalem, is not mentioned in the Quran. And the, the word Israel, Israel is mentioned for 43 times. So people starting to question that, people uh, asking the question, is Al-Aqsa, like the, um, you know, the Temple Mount was really in Jerusalem? There are uh, other theories that said it, it was in uh, Saudi Arabia. And if you look where uh, Nabi Muhammad, where Muhammad lived his entire life, it was around Saudi Arabia. So what, what's your take on that? Okay, so this, this uh, goes um, 700 years after the Hasmonean period. So Judaism existed for hundreds of years once Islam comes onto the, uh, onto the map. Um, one of the things that I, I say th towards the end of the book is that the emergence of Judaism is super important, not only for understanding Judaism, but for understanding the history of the last 2,000 years of human existence, right? Because Christianity was born out of Judaism and Islam was born out of Judaism. So um, I, I can't speak to the Quran and, and, and so th this is you know quite a bit after the, the period that I'm dealing with, but I would say that uh, the emergence of Judaism is important for understanding the, the very roots of both Christianity and Islam. Yeah. The first temple yes. was how many thousand years? The first temple is quite a bit before the period that we're talking about. So the first temple is, um, let's say, from uh, the 900s, BCE until 586 BCE. Okay, and again, we, when we, whenever I say BCE, we have to think minus before the common era. Okay, and then after that, we have the Persian period for let's say 200 years, and then the Hellenistic period. The Hasmonean period is within the Hellenistic period. So, from your uh, studies, after and you don't have any evidence that on the first temple, the mass of people, exactly. the way we are told in Yom Kippur, that people went there and they prayed and did it, did. Not during the first temple period. Very nice. Any other questions? Well, what do you think about the Babylonian period uh, after First Temple? Um, 
because you know you say most of uh, evidence come from uh, the Hashmonaim, which yeah. is uh, pretty much after. Yeah. And do you think uh, the Judaism evolved when we when we were in Babylonian in uh, diaspora, um, kind of reminding us what is Israel and what is Judaism? Right. So again, I, I want to distinguish between when an idea was put into print, not print, but written down. Some of these laws might have been written down during the Babylonian period. I don't know. What I'm interested in is when the masses knew about it and were practicing it. And we don't have any evidence that they were doing so during the Babylonian period, during the period of the exile. We, we simply don't have evidence for it. It's on Amazon and it's here on this this bench, so you can yeah. pick up you can pick up a copy. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Um, forty dollars.